Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou, oh my God, of every blessing. That's why you came today. You came to receive the presence of God in your life again and again and again. So that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks as we've talked about our walk, the, the manner of life that we have. When I started the series, I talked about the phrase walkabout from Australian culture. And that's when a young man would walk through the wilderness of Australia in preparation for manhood, deepening his understanding of their own thoughts, traditions, and cultures. And he would bury himself. He would immerse himself and come out of his walkabout ready for manhood. This is how we have been studying. There are things that we need to bury and immerse and, and just fill ourselves with in our Christian life, in our understanding of God. And so we've gone through a series. We've talked about worthy this way. We've talked about walking this way. We've talked about this, that, and the other. And bringing it finally to a close in walk worthy. So I'm going to start us in the Old Testament. We're going to quickly jump over to the New Testament and spend some time there. The verse I want to read to you out of the Old Testament is from 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3. Be strong, show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in His ways, keeping His statutes, His commandments, His rules, and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. David is dying. David is coming to the end of his life, and Solomon is ready to take the, the role of king, and David is giving him fatherly wisdom, fatherly advice. And he's telling Solomon the things that he needs to know. And we've got this recorded, and it's wonderful. The words of a dying father have a lot of weight, but the words of a living God have even more. And that's why it's in our scripture. These are not just words of a dying king. These are words of a living God that have been preserved for us. He tells Solomon to show himself to be a man. Stand up. Do the right things. Prove yourself brave by keeping the commandments of God. In the New American Standard Bible, it lists his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances. As you see in the English version, it talks about his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. The Hebrew language is simply saying here that he is to keep the keeping of Jehovah. When you look at the Hebrew structure of this verse here and in other places in the Old Testament, it talks about keeping the keeping of Jehovah. The ways, the meanings, the thoughts, the traditions, the words that are commandments and statutes. Never once will you hear David tell Solomon or anybody else in the scripture, by the way, these are some really good suggestions from God. God does not make suggestions, folks. God gives truth in the way of, here's my commandments, here's my ordinances, here's my statutes. This is what I want you to do. Not a suggestion. Clear instruction. And you do this so that you may succeed. You do these things, you keep these words of mine, you keep on keeping Jehovah because you need to succeed. God has a desire for our success. But that success looks different. If you just look up a, de a definition, success starts with the desire to achieve something. And if your motivation is weak, your results will follow suit. And just think about what that means when you desire in your spiritual walk to pursue God. 
in all you do, wherever you turn, God wants you to be successful. The thing that you desire the most, your pursuit and your motivation for that will guide you. And so he's very clear in all that you do, wherever you turn, God is there guiding you with his words so that you would be successful, not for your own benefit, but for his glory. So now we move to Colossians. Colossians is an interesting passage of scripture. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae because like most of the early churches, like most of the later churches, there's always an issue. And Paul decides to address this issue. He wants to refute the heresy that is growing in that church. That particular letter has a theme of the adequacy, complete adequacy of Jesus in contrast with the emptiness of man's philosophical thinking. There were smart people back back then in the church. There were smart people, very reasonable people, very well-reasoned people in the churches of that day. But they would sometimes try to impose their philosophical standings and understandings over Christ. The heresy was Jesus plus makes your salvation work. And so often the the plus side of that would be Jesus plus live like a good Jewish person. So all you non-Jews need to convert or all you bad Jews need to straighten up. But it was if you follow the, the trend of Jewish tradition and believe in Jesus, you'll be a good Christian. You'll be a good follower. You'll be saved. Paul says, no way, no how. It's just Jesus which gives us a lot of room here because none of us that I know of come from a Jewish background culture. So whatever culture you come from, fine, but Jesus is all you need for salvation. That's where we're going to start looking at Colossians. That's where we're going to end up looking at Colossians. We're only going to look at a few verses, so let's walk through this. Beginning in verse 9 of the first chapter of Colossians. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let me just kind of mention that in all spiritual wisdom and understanding kind of goes back to the second Kings that you could be successful in all you do. Follow my commandments, gain wisdom. praying for you. I have not ceased. We have not ceased praying for you. You have an advocate before God who is the Christ. We celebrate his birth. We live in the luxury of his grace. But you have an advocate before God who is Jesus. But you also have an advocate before God in your pastor. I pray for my church. Some of you share things with me of a particular nature going on in your life. I pray for you as my church members. I will not cease to pray for you. Nothing you can do, people, can make me stop praying for you. So there. I'm just going to be that stubborn in my obedience to God. There are other people in this church church family who are praying for you. There are people, and I know that there are people who pray for our church all the time. You might as well just accept they're not praying like big umbrella kind of prayers that God just kind of goes, okay, yeah, whatever. When they pray for the church, that includes you individually, all your needs, all your issues, all your things that are going on in life. And yours may be different from yours, and yours may be different from yours, but they are praying for you. God is hearing those prayers because that's what he does. And God is responding to those prayers. What would it do for you to really get a a grip of that? 
What would it do for you to really understand that you, individually, your life, your issues, your joys, your sorrows, all of these things are being brought before the holy God of the universe all the time without ceasing? Hmm. What would that do for you? What would that do for your walk? What would that do for your motivation to walk worthy? But then I also have to ask, what would... What would someone have to do to make you quit praying for them? Just want to plant that thought. What would you have to do to me to make me want to stop praying for you? We can imagine all kinds of little things or horrible things. But as far as I can, and I am by no means perfect, I am going to pray for you. We have not, he's not talking about Christ, he's talking about himself and those around him. We have never ceased to pray for you, church in Colossae. There are people in this church who would stand with me as I say, I'm going to pray for this church every day. Some of you in particular on some days, but all of you I'm going to pray for every day. I hope you don't try to invent ways to try to make me quit. And you know what? (laughs) You don't even have to ask if I'd stop. You know, Ken, it's okay. You don't need to pray for me anymore. I've got this. Sorry. Going to do it anyway. Just that ornery. Another thing I want to look here is where it says that you ask. The asking here that you be filled with with the knowledge of his will. Now, how cool would this be? How cool would it be to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God? You probably have some of that knowledge already. You probably could get some more. Ask that you be filled. That's what I'm asking for you. We're going into this year of growth. I'm asking that you as a church, be filled with the knowledge of His will, His will, and how your life is going to fit into that. I know Doug's been studying and experiencing God. He understands my language when I say that. God does not have a will for you individually. God does not have a will for our church individually. God has His will what he's going to do, what he's going to be about. And we have to determine how can we move into that? How can we fit into that will that God has? It's not about us. On the back of the holy half sheet last week, I included a little thing because we didn't have sermon notes. I included a little thing about making these New Year's resolutions and goals and all that. And it wasn't goals that you ought to make. It was guidelines that you ought to have when you make your goals And they should all be about God and His glory and not about you and your gain. You want to set a goal to be healthier? What's the bottom line here? You want to lose some weight? That's always mine. Usually by the 2nd of January, that's out the window. But you want to lose weight? Why? So that you can be stronger and healthier, so you can serve God better? If that's really your heart, go for it. If you want to lose weight because you want to look good in those new clothes you got for Christmas, sorry. You're not going to have any help with that. God helps you when you go in His direction, when you pursue His will. Just think, knowing the will of God, what, what kind of fullness, what kind of richness, what kind of depth... What kind of responsibility that would add to your life? That's why those of us who pray are praying that you are filled with the knowledge of His will. Knowledge, real knowledge, means a lot more than just the accumulation of facts, okay? The depth of the thing that you know defines the impact of that knowledge within your life. 
The depth of the thing that you know defines the impact of that knowledge in your life. Let me illustrate. I know, my wife always hates it when I talk about her in the sermon. She doesn't really, but she's not always great with it. But I know that Mary Kay is a woman, okay? That's pretty obvious. I know she's a woman. I know some. The depth of that knowledge has some impact. I'll never understand, you know, the woman. But I know she's a woman. You know she's a woman. You can look over there and see, yep, she's a woman. Here's something, though, that I know. I know that she truly loves me. Now, that's a little more complex knowledge, isn't it? The depth is, is way different, but it defines, for me to know that she truly loves me, really defines the depth of that knowledge that I have. So you see the difference? You can just know stuff, or you can know some things that are much deeper. That's what we're talking about here. You see the difference? Well, in spiritual wisdom, do you just know things about God? Or do you have the understanding to apply those things within your life that pursue His will in your life, that impact your life with His will, His design, His desires? Just knowing enough information about God that you could pass a God quiz all right, I got 10 questions for you today, Bill, on characteristics of God. And Bill could probably answer my 10 questions. He, he knows God's stuff. But does he take that knowledge and let it really deeply impact his walk? That's the question we all have to deal with. Verse 10. So as, in, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him. What does it mean to please God? It's not just getting on His good side. What does it mean to truly please Him? What does it mean? I mean, let's take this back to our human level of understanding. What does it mean? to truly please your spouse. Not just get on their good side. What does it mean to please your boss or those who work under your supervision? What does it mean to please them truly, not just get on their good side? There's a big difference. In this case, pleasing is not supposed to be transactional. Well, I'm going to try to please God so that He can bless me I've been praying about this going on in my life for a long time, and, and it's a serious thing. And, and I think if I can be pleasing to God, if I can do some more spiritual push-ups, if I can do some more spiritual disciplines off that list, then maybe God will answer my prayers like I want Him to answer them. This is not a transactional thing to please God. This is just simply to please God. I don't have to define that any more than that. I don't really need extensive horticultural experience to look at an apple tree and see an apple and go, that's an apple tree, right? I mean, I'm pretty quick, but I am no apple genius. I just see the fruit, that's the tree, I get it. Well, your bearing fruit in your life defines you. I don't need extensive theological training to see the fruit in your life as it defines your relationship to God. You don't need great theological training to see the fruit in my life. It will define my relationship to God. We recognize fruit when we see it. I... I just don't want to be ignorant of the obvious things that God wants me to see. 
walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work. Well, let me stop there. Every, not just some, not just most, in every work that you do, when you're on the clock, when you're off the clock, when you're thinking about church stuff, when you're not thinking about church stuff, when you're aware of God, when you're not aware of God, who is still present anyway, just because you're not thinking about Him doesn't matter. In every good. Now, there's probably different definitions of good, but I'm pretty sure that we all have some idea of what God's definition of good would be. I know when I'm not being good. I don't know if that's Bill and Vaudine Dillard being pounded from the back of my head as my parents raised me to be good. But I'm pretty sure I know what God wants and when I'm good and when I'm not. One of my friends down in New Orleans, Linda Middlebrooks, she and Larry Mingus ran for years and years and decades and decades one of the Baptist centers down there in New Orleans. And I've worked with them for years with students and all this. We still stay in touch. Mary Kay and I went out for dinner with them just this summer when we drove through. And she wished me Merry Christmas last night online. And so I wrote her back, Merry Christmas, friend, and give that Larry guy a hug too. She quickly wrote back, do I have to? <laughs> and I quickly responded to her, so you've started your naughty list early for next Christmas. <laughs> See, we know what's good and what's not good. And from a spiritual sense, we know what God's definition of good is. But that's also a part of the studying of his laws and his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes. He defines what he considers good very clearly. There'll be days that the real work that needs to be done may not be fun, but it says every good work. No one said that work would always be fun. No one said that it would ever be easy. But if they, they say if you like what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. That's almost true, but not quite. Because I like what I do here and with the students, I really do. And I have a rule, if I'm not having fun, I'm doing something wrong. But there are days when it's work. And I choose to do it, and I know it's got to be done, and we just buckle down and get it done. We took 53 students to Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge area, a couple of weekends ago. And my job was not to be the teacher. I brought a guy in for that. My job was to be the cook. And Mary Kay and I cooked three meals a day for those 53 college students who eat like 106. <laughs> some of them are vegetarian. Some of them are gluten-free. Some of them are dairy-free. Some don't like red meat. Some can't have this nut. Some can't have that nut. It just makes cooking a chore. And I don't always enjoy the choreness of cooking, but I like to cook. Work, every good work. But work, here's some theology for you. Work was given to us before the fall. Read your scripture real close. The man and the woman were giving charge over the creatures that God had created over the garden before the fall. Work is not a part of the fall, much to your misunderstanding. Sometimes you feel like work is part of the fall. If we hadn't messed up back in the garden, we wouldn't have to work. Yeah, you would. And you'd still have to work hard. But we are pursuing the will of God. The way we pursue that is our walk and we need to be worthy in our walk in every good 
work. And it says, as it closes out, and increasing in the knowledge of God. There it is, that knowledge thing again. Comes up a second time even in this passage. Where it must be important. God keeps coming back to that. The knowledge of God. Laws, ordinances, statutes, the words of God that we are to know and let these give us wisdom and ways to walk worthy. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Strengthened with all power. Okay, you are not going to have the power of God. You are not going to have God's power. You're not going to be able to call down fire from heaven on the city just because they didn't welcome you. You're not going to be able to part the sea. You're not going to be able to, you do not have God's power. But what God gives you to work through you has a purpose. This power that you are to seek, strengthened with all power, is a purposeful thing. And its purpose is so that you can attain endurance and patience. Wow. I mean, I can see how that would add to my life. If I had more endurance, if I had more patience in my spiritual pursuit, we're not just talking about, I want to run further. I want to work harder in the yard. I want to last a little longer out chopping wood. I'm talking about in pursuit of the knowledge and the will of God my endurance and my patience for that. That's what he's saying. Strengthened with all power according to his glory, his glorious might, not mine, for all endurance and patience with joy. Endurance. Let me just open that up a little bit. Catching your second wind. This is a phrase that runners understand. The second wind. Second wind, and I looked up, I got kind of a definition here. It's the phenomenon in distance running, such as marathons or road running, whereby an athlete who is out of breath and too tired to continue suddenly finds the strength to press on at top performance with less exertion. And I've heard that phrase a long time. They're just getting their second wind. You can see them. When those runners are pushing, that last mile of the marathon and that last five miles of the marathon and that last 15 miles of the marathon, they get that second wind. Sometimes it's called hitting the wall right before that. You hit the wall so that you cannot go on anymore. Your body is complaining. Your mind is going to mush. You have hit the wall physically in your exertion. And if you just... Go ahead and run into the wall, which never sounds like a good idea to me. If you hit the wall hard, there's second wind on the other side of that. All of a sudden, something in your physiology kicks in, and you not only persist in the race, but you even increase in the race. I think that's an amazing way that God made us. I think that's just flat out interesting. Another truth, most people have never experienced that because they hit the wall and they quit. They don't know what the second wind is like. They don't know what the second wind can do because they do not endure They have not disciplined their mind over their body, knowing that this is a true thing, that it's happening to the people all around them in the race already, maybe. And if they would just persist, if they would just press on, they would find the endurance. In your Christian walk, in your relationships with each other as a church, in your quiet time, in your Bible reading, in your prayer life, all the other disciplines, if you would just persist through the wall, on the other side of that is the second wind of Christ 
empowering you and lifting you and giving you the endurance to pursue him more successfully than it was just up to that point. This has huge spiritual implications for us, folks. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. Hmm. Hebrews 12, 1 says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which is so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Because there are others watching, endure. Because you need to set aside that sin that entangles you, endure in that effort. Because to run with endurance the race, you have to have this knowledge. And I'll always remember the story I heard about the runner from some foreign country in the Olympics and he fell and he hurt his leg and all this kind of stuff. And he should have dropped out of the race right then. He was badly injured and yet he didn't. And an hour or so after the race was over and everybody was leaving the finish line, he comes hobbling in and crosses the finish line. And when asked by a reporter, he simply said, my country did not send me here to begin the race, but to finish the race. Your God has not placed a call on your life just to begin the spiritual race, but he wants to give you that second win, that endurance and that patience to pursue after him so that you can finish the race, to walk in that manner worthy of the Lord and finish the race that he's called you to and finish the race that he's given you a, a vision for. And here's the question that we all have to wrestle with. Can God depend on us to endure? Can God depend on us to carry on despite the challenges, to carry on despite the, the struggles, to, to strive our very best? Can God depend on us? Can God depend on me as the pastor of the church, along with my other fellow pastors of the church? Can God depend on me and Brandon and Harry? Can he depend on us? to strive, to endure, to get to the finish? Can God depend on you? No pressure here, right? Isn't that what the preacher's supposed to do is just put the pressure on you? I'm trying my best this morning. God needs to depend on you, church, to endure to the end. And you have to wrestle with the question, can he or not? Are you willing to just be satisfied with where you are in your spiritual walk? Or are you willing to grow? Are you willing to be satisfied with your commitment to God? Or are you willing to pursue that? Are you willing to be satisfied with what you're doing in life to celebrate God in your life, to show God to others? Are you satisfied with that? And you're ready to hang up the shoes and quit running? Or will you endure? Funny thing about this Christian race that we're in, the finish line isn't on this side. The finish line is on the other side of the gates. That's when you'll hear the master say, well done. I've prepared a place for you. Take a breath. Enjoy. So we wrestle, and we wrestle against all kinds of things in life. But God, over and over and over in Scripture, commands, gives us rules, statutes to keep, not suggestions, that will cause us, in the keeping of these, to know Him 
and to endure and to be patient with ourselves, be patient with each other, and be patient with God. Because that's probably what hurts us as, as much as anything. We lose patience with ourselves, with others, with God. And we don't endure. Last verse says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. In the New American Standard, it says, it, it includes the word joy, which is at the end of verse 11. It puts it over in verse 12 and says, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Who has qualified you for salvation? Who's qualified you through salvation? To be qualified is to be done by someone else who is even more qualified than you are. You believe this to the heart of your being. I don't want to be qualified by my own estimations. I go into the hospital for surgery. I don't want a surgeon who's been qualified by my mechanic on my car. My, my mechanic is great on my car, and he can fix a lot of stuff, but I don't think he's the one to qualify my surgeon in the hospital to work on me. He needs someone even greater than he is to qualify him. So I don't need to be qualified by myself. I don't need to seek the qualification of someone who is Really, we're all on the same level in the eyes of God. So I'm not going to qualify you. God is going to qualify you. God is going to qualify you by your salvation. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. The gospel is the story of of God's activity in his created world. The gospel includes creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. The gospel is in every way what qualifies us to believe in God, to seek his will, to endure with patience, to have the joy that passes any understanding that we would have, along with the peace of his presence and the comfort and the strength and all these things that we are to pursue in order to walk in a manner worthy. Inheritance is the life that God has promised us. It's the life that he planned from the beginning for his creation to enjoy with him. It's the life that is uninterrupted fellowship with our creator. This is the inheritance that he offers us. And the only way we get qualified for that inheritance is through the salvation of Jesus Christ. I have to know that I was designed and built to be with God. That was God's desire. That is his purpose. That is his heartbeat. It's for me, Ken Dillard, for you, your name here, to be with God. But along the way, we did something that put something between us and God. That was our disobedience. That was us doing what we know to be wrong, to be bad in God's eyes. And nobody has to tell us there's something inside that's just built in. It goes, whoops. And you look around, see if anybody saw you. But really what you're doing is you're looking around inside to see in your spirit, did God notice that? I was created to be with him, but I messed it up and put something in my life 
that keeps me from being in his holy presence. Because God cannot entertain evil. God cannot entertain sin. God cannot be in the company of brokenness because he's holy and he's righteous and he's pure. And I would have him no other way, nor would you. So we're sunk, right? We're done. We have no possibility, no second chance, no nothing, because we've blown this ourselves. God does not choose for us to do evil. We choose that. But what God chose all the way back in the garden was to send the seed of a woman, Jesus Christ, who we just celebrated his coming into our world so that we could actually see and touch and feel and understand. God sent a Savior who said, I'll cover your sin. I'll cover your brokenness. I'll cover your wrong. You can't do it for yourself. You can't keep enough rules. You can't because you can't keep them all. You can't be perfect because only I am perfect. But I will take my perfection and trade it for your imperfection. And that's what he did on the cross for us. He took on our imperfection. You know this story if you've been in church very long, but you might just need to hear it again. He took your imperfection and put it upon himself, and he took his perfection and made it available to you. He didn't just put it on you as if you had no choice in it. He took his perfection and put it out there and said, this is available to you because this I have made available to me. And he died for your sin because that's what you were going to have to do for it and be separated from him forever. And he took that on. And then not only did he make his perfection available to you, he took your sin, wadded it up and threw it away and rose again from the grave saying, death is not going to keep me down and it's not going to keep you down if you just take this perfection that I want to share with you. And when you do, when you say to God, you know what? I have been wrong. I have been broken. I know when I've done bad and I'm sorry. May I please have your perfection instead? God is like, like the father of the prodigal son, pacing back and forth on the front porch. Every day that child was away from him, every day that he had taken his toys and gone off to play on his own, every day that child was gone, father's pacing the front porch, looking down the road to see someday, maybe my son will come back. And every day God looks down the road from his front porch of heaven saying, Someday, maybe my child will come back. And as soon as he saw his son coming down the road, he ran. He picked up his robes because that's what they wore in that day because he couldn't run as good, so he picked it up. And he ran down the road and embraced his son, threw a party, made the other son even mad because he was so glad that the son who had been gone who had done wrong, who had been broken, even the men who work in my father's house, even the very laborers who labor for my father have a better life than what I've got now. I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. Just let me be one of your laborers. Just let me live in the shadow of your house. And the father said, no way, you're my son, you're my child. God says to you, no way will you ever live in the shadow again. You're my child. And you'll be restored. And the inheritance here is the life that God planned from the very first. Unfiltered, unrestrained, unrestricted presence with him. The absence of brokenness. The absence of evil. That's what qualifies you to share is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I hope that everyone here on the Sunday after Christmas 
everyone watching online, I hope that you have already experienced this restoration that God qualifies you with. I want that to be true. And I know that you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. God still restores me. God still thunks me on the back of the head. I saw Brandon's oldest straighten out his little brother when we were first setting up and he was trying to get the camera in place and the little brother was in the way. He said, get out of the way. Ignored. Get out of the way. Ignored. Thwop. <laughs> oh, me. And he got out of the way. God still has to thwop me on the back of the head every now and then and get me out of the way so he can do his work. But he loves me and he's given me that perfection and he's offered that for you and if you've not accepted that I would so like to have a conversation with you about that if that's what you would like to do. And again, I look across the room and I don't know who has and who hasn't. We don't have like an initial on our forehead that makes it easy to see. But you know your heart. And so if you're hearing my voice, whether you're live and in color here or you're live and in color on the video, all you have to do is say, God, I am sorry for when I was wrong and I'm sorry when I broke your rules, and I'm sorry that I even have to call on you to do this, but you can do it, and I can't. Would you give me your perfection? And he will say, he will say, yes. I have his word on it. He will say yes, if you ask. We're going to sing a song. This is a time for you to respond to what God, not me, has been saying in your heart. My words have been in your ears, but I hope God's words have been in your heart. This is how you walk worthy. Listen to his words more than anybody else's. How will you respond to what he says to you individually? Part of my job is for us as a church to respond properly. And I'm going to work at that through the year of growth in 2022. And I'm going to ask you to work along beside me that we can grow. But I want you to respond right now because God wants you to grow individually. You might, and we don't always do this. I know we have a few that will come down and pray and they have things going on, but you might... Maybe just finish out the year making a fresh commitment to God. And Harry's good on the piano. He can play for hours. So if you need to come down and you want to talk to the preacher guy, I'll talk to you. Nobody will hear it because we'll turn this off. If you want to just come and pray, then come and pray. And you could do it from where you sit and nobody would ever know you'd be safe. Maybe that's part of our problem. We try to play it too safe with our Christianity. I want you to know that I am rededicating my efforts to serve the Lord in the coming year. I'm saying that to the Father and I'm saying that in front of His children. I'd like to give you the opportunity to say that as well. Like I said, you can say that right where you sit. But if we have a whole parade of people coming down here to pray or talk to the pastor guy, that's okay today. Because I was going to be early, but I'm not. Doesn't matter. Your leftover Christmas dinner will be still waiting for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you love us. You are truly such a great and gracious God to not only have patience with us and provide for us, but you endure.
You are the picture of endurance, and you keep coming to us. You keep knocking on our heart. You keep seeking after us until we... Father, I hope that this morning, until we can't resist you anymore, let us begin again, Father, as a church to serve you, as individuals to serve you. Help us to become worthy in the manner that we follow you, that we walk after you. Make us worthy by your grace. Make us worthy by your words. Make us worthy, Father, by your love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever believes in him, Lord, what a great passage for you to put in your word. But if we just believe, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.